interpreted here. This was a feast that originated in the 13th century in Belgium. And it came first from the ministry and visions of uh, St. Juliana of Liège. And it started in the 1240s, the celebration of this feast. And it spread to the Universal Church um, in the, about 1275. And the original author of the liturgies for this day was St. Thomas Aquinas himself. So really a, a very interesting pedigree there. Uh, the readings today are very interesting. Uh, John's gospel, John 6, is where the gospel reading is taken from. And chapter 6 in the gospel of John is the Eucharistic chapel. Chapter. Unlike the synoptic gospels there, Jesus talks about the Eucharist at the Last Supper. John talks about the Eucharist here. And what he says to his audience is very shocking. In fact, they say, how can this man give us his body and blood to drink and to eat? And Jesus says, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you will not have life within you. Uh, very central to us is Catholics. Um, and also the, 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 you, it's, it's the parallel driven is driven by the first reading where Moses speaks about uh, God is talking to the ancient Israelites and saying, remember that I fed you in the desert. God feeds us is a big theme of this day and something we're called to take on board, something we're called to meditate on and reflect on as we look at this day. And another thing that the Eucharist does is it creates a community. And that's shown in our second reading where it, Paul talks about how we are of one, just as one loaf is a body of Christ, we are all part because we're sharers in the one loaf. Uh, in commenting on the Eucharist, St. Augustine talked about the bond of charity created by the Eucharist. And that's something that St. Gaspar del Buffalo picked up on. In fact, we as missionaries of the precious blood don't take vows. We live by the bond of charity. And so that's kind of the start off. Um, what are your thoughts about this day, Vicki? I'm gonna let Tim jump in because he has a quick announcement before I begin. Yeah, I just wanted to say if you uh, if you just joined us, um, we're, this is Tapping the Wine Cellar from the Missionaries of the Precious Blood, Kansas City Province. And we've got Father Keith who is just speaking and Vicki Otto who's the Director of Companions who is gonna be sharing just a little bit about the, the, um, the readings for this week. Uh, as we uh, go on this, uh, you can, um, I really encourage you to make comments or thought, share your thoughts or questions, as well as answer the question that Father Keith posed to us earlier, is how you have been fed by God during the pandemic without the Eucharist. So, uh, Vicki, could you uh, tell us what you're, what you're thinking, what you've been reflecting on? I come to this feast with a past history working in the interfaith community. And because of that, this feast always on the surface makes me a little uncomfortable because we recognize as church that we are a broken church and we are a broken communion table in that, like at the second reading, when Paul said we are all one body, in reality, we're not. And in reality, everyone is not welcome to the table. So I bring that burden to my comments as well. Um, I think of what uh, one of the wisdom figures in my life, and I think she's a wisdom figure in our precious blood community, uh, companion Connie Swymiller said to me once at a gathering, she said, in the Catholic church, we have more rules to keep people out than we do to let them in. Yeah. And this all kind of marries what Eucharist means. And that brings some uncomfortableness to me, not only for people of different faith traditions, but people of different life circumstances who are not welcome at the table. So I bring that with me. But in the gospel today, there was a line that really struck me. And it was when Jesus said, remain in me and I in him. Because the word abide, to live in, occurs 40 times in the Gospel of John. 
And it, anybody who's read scripture knows that, um, like most people, the more it's repeated, the more important it is. So remain in me, abide in me, and I in him. So it emphasizes that we're not to have a superficial relationship with Jesus or a superficial relationship with God. He's supposed to live within us so deep and so intimately that he is in us. And so I bring that along with how do we as communities say who's in or out when if we have such a deep relationship, who are we to judge, to, to use the phrase of Pope Francis, about who's in or who's out, at whether they could receive Eucharist or not. So I find that interesting. Jesus is the one who dwells in God and he dwells in us. And so God dwells in us. So there's that intimate relationship of communion that is much deeper than that five minute me and Jesus moment that happens at Sunday liturgy. So I'll start with that because I know that's um, a loaded, a lo was a loaded <laughs> a few minutes. <laughs> you know, Vicki, uh, you know, you're talking about the, um, you know, a table, you know, the, the table and being with people. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, the, the word abide, uh, that, that jumped out at me as well. And uh, I mean, part of it was, is that at, at my wedding, um, uh, the homilist talked about, you know, abiding being really important in any relationship and including a, a marriage and, you know, being with each other. Um, and, and then also he talked about how important that was to, you know, in, in my life and in my wife's life, uh, you know, before that. Um, and, and I was kind of thinking about that, the table, uh, you know, I think the healthiest tables I've ever been a part um, whether that's family, community, uh, you know, friends, um, you know, when I've been been at people's homes or when people have come into my own home or when we've been sharing uh, a Eucharistic meal or, uh, or, you know, wherever we have a meal with each or wherever we break bread with someone else um, uh, is that the healthy ones are where people are listening to each other, uh, places where we're, where we're uh, hearing each other's stories um, and, and not thinking, well, you know, right away, well, I'm going to respond with what I hear, but taking in what we hear. And, and, I'm, and I've been thinking of especially a lot about this with, um, you know, over the last few weeks, I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot is, um, you know, listening to the stories of people whose stories aren't often heard, uh, whether that's in the media, in, in, our, in our lives, whether we have connections with people, um, and I'm thinking especially of, you know, African Americans and people of color and, and, and people from outside the United States, um, and how do we, how do, how do, as individuals and as communities, we really need to be challenged to listen to each other and, and listen to the stories of people who have been hurt, whose, whose pain is real, whose pain may have been caused by me, um, or, or in the case of, um, you know, police brutality or systemic racism, you know, how those stories, um, hearing those stories of how that has affected, you know, people and communities and, and, um, and really reflecting on like, how can I be a part of making sure that that voice is heard, that I'm listening and that we're also doing something uh, about that. Um, and, and so that's, that's kind of where I've been with, with, with this, you know, with this over the last few weeks. Um, and especially when you're talking about, you know, we're, when we're talking about the Eucharist and, and, and sitting down and eating with each other. So um, I'm, I'm kind of curious to hear people's thoughts on Facebook and also uh, Father Keith and, and Vicki, what kind of uh, other things do you see in the scriptures for this weekend? I'm always surprised because um, if you're ever, if you're in parish life, one of the things you hear all the time is when there is a situation that occurs in, at, in a parish, the natural response is, well, let's have a mass about this. Let's do a mass and bring people together. But Tim, I think you hit right on the money. You can't bring people to the Eucharist. You can't bring people together if they first haven't sat down and gotten to know each other and shared the story. 
uh, Eucharist should be the end result, not the band-aid to piece it all together. And so I think you're really hitting on something. And I was reminiscing as I was thinking about this. Um, I remember as a kid, we learned um, being a cradle Catholic. And I know I was a kid when the dinosaurs walked on the earth um, that mass still counted if you got to church before they took the veil off the chalice. And we'll see how many of our listeners can remember what that actually means. Um, so we just kind of didn't regard the whole table of the word. So how could we appreciate the table of the Eucharist if we don't appreciate the table of the word? How can Jesus abide in us if we don't listen and take in the words of Jesus to learn from him? Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, and to give you a little bit of my story, which you may or may not know, I'm a convert to Catholicism. I did not become Catholic till I was 24 years old. And I grew up a Presbyterian. I went to a Methodist college in Central Missouri, now called Central Methodist University. And uh, I worked for Disciples of Christ Church there. And so I've been around the block a few times. Uh, I think that really what we need to focus on as Catholics and as Christians in general is what we have in common. And that's something that we're really leaving behind. We're really working as a country where we're kind of working to exclude people from the American dream. And as church, we try to exclude people from Christ. It doesn't work because Christ will make sure it doesn't work. But, um, we're, we're, we're kind of setting ourselves up as judges, and we shouldn't. We do this at our peril. We do this at our spiritual peril. Mm -hmm. And to recognize that even, even though we have different ways of acclaiming Christ, we all both, those of us that call ourselves Christians generally believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world. And this, the gospel, the scripture is something we do share, even though we don't have, we're not in total agreement of what books belong in the Bible or which verses are that important. But we have that in common and we have to start from our commonality. Mm -hmm. And we just, we, we've lost uh, track of working on that. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I do wanna say real quick that uh, Vicki, I don't think you're old enough to remember the dinosaurs uh, being around, <laughs> but maybe the, um, uh, the saber toothed tigers and the, um, and uh, the woolly mammoth, but um, oh, you're very cute. Not the dinosaurs. I'm here for you, Vicky. Always here to compliment. Um, I'm a I'm a charmer like that. Uh, and I don't think I'm ever going to be allowed to host this thing again. Um, <laughs> I I really like the idea, especially in our world when we're not able as Catholics to receive communion. You know, many of the churches are opening it up, opening up, and they're opening at a very limited fashion. So we have to celebrate Eucharist in different ways. And I think the sharing the stories becomes so prevalent now because um, we can't have that moment, that Eucharistic moment at the table. Um, I have found that as I have listened to masses online during the pandemic, I, the liturgy of the word um, and the preaching has become more profound for me because I'm able to focus on it more and not just skate through the liturgy like we often do as Catholics. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking of something St. Augustine said about the Eucharist. And, and he said, our challenge in the Eucharist is to become what we eat and drink. And that's something that helped bring me to Catholicism to start with. But I think it's something that you can challenge us all as Christians, because if we're all part of the one lo loaf, uh, as church, we're called to be Eucharist for the world. We ourselves. And, and that's uh, a, 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 how are we Christ for the world? How do we help feed the world? How do we help heal the world? I think it's just as valid a thing 
for us as um, Catholics is sharing the Eucharist. And, and I've missed the Eucharist too, I mean. I think there's a real disconnect in um, our lives as Catholics and our lives of faith in that um, I learned from the first pastor I worked for he called Eucharist, he said one of the most profound moments for him as a priest is when he could go to the bedside of someone who's dying and share communion, viaticum, food for the journey. And I know that for many people don't realize that the food that we receive at liturgy on Sunday, that body and blood of Christ is not a unique me and Jesus moment. It's food for our journey because we're supposed to, like the disciples, go down from the mountain and go back out to the world and continue to bring forth the kingdom of God. And that Eucharist sustains us and gives us energy. If it's the 21st century, you know, maybe our, our, our uh, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, they'll call it the energy bar of faith. I, you know? <laughs> <laughs> very good very good when i was uh going to school things that i learned about the eucharist i learned are four things take bless break share and focusing on what we get kind of goes around all of that if we're just focused on getting the cookie as the kid might say um because the action of Eucharist is all of these. And it's not just the action of the Eucharist when we celebrate it together, but it's the action when we live our lives as part of the body of Christ, I would think. And being in communion becomes so important. Again, to break away from that uh, me and Jesus moment to recognize, you know, I wish I've had a nickel for every time people have said, well, why do I have to go to church on Sunday? And it's not only to be in communion with God, it's to be in communion with each other and to bring forth that body of Christ and to make that body of Christ come to life. So I'm a little bit curious, you know, Father Keith, you posted that you, you posed the question, you know, how have you been fed during the pandemic? Um, so I'm going to find if I turn it around on y'all and hear what you have to think about that. Uh, <sighs> I know you hate when I do that to you. Thank you, Tim. It's a great question. You're, do you're doing a great job, Tim. Uh, <laughs> and I will go forth to say that one thing we need to do is Chris, Christians is answer the questions we ask. So I'll try to answer the question you asked. Um, for me, it's been, I, I live in a nursing home, as I've said before, and I make it a point every day to go visit folks. Um, and it's, you know, different. I figure we're all safe because we've been cooped up here for two and a half months together in isolation. So, uh, but, um, for me, Eucharist here is interacting with them, being present to them. Um, that's the real presence. And I hope that my presence to them, and I don't wear this. I mean, when I'm at home, I wear ordinary clothes. Um, I think that's being the real presence of Christ means we're really present to each other. I try not to lecture at them or anything like that. I ask them how they're doing. We talk about what's going on. I hear the complaints. When are we going to get out of here? I don't know. God hasn't told me. I'm sorry. But um, but for me, that's real presence. Being genuine with one another. Being compassionate with one another. And that's what's fed me during this time. So we do have a comment. Before we get to Vicki, uh, we do have a comment from uh, a companion, Trudy. Uh, who's joining us from California. It's good to see a Trudy on, on with us. Uh, she said that she's, she's been fed by spiritual communion. Um, so that's, you know, that's a really great answer. And we'd love to hear other people's answer to that question as well. Uh, and, and Vicki, I'm going to turn that, that question over to you. I think the pandemic has challenged me to slow down 
as many people know, my work requires that I'm usually on the road for a lot of the year. So I spend a lot of time in airports, a lot of time in rental cars. And so the pandemic has forced me to slow down. And because of that, I have had the opportunity, you know, I try to go out for walks every day and um, just to see that be in communion with nature and God, you know, to see the buds coming up from the trees, which you don't notice when you're flying down the free, freeway at 70 miles an hour. Um, the other thing that's really surprising to me is being that even though I've been in Kansas City now for almost five years, I still am a relative newcomer. And the pandemic has really, um, it's amazing. You're on a walk and people you don't know are waving at you. Hey, good morning. And um, we, in our neighborhood, you kind of see all the same people, especially I usually go out at the same time and they're like, hey, how's work been today? You know, and so there's been a communion in a whole different way outside of church, which is really, I think, um, amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's really good, great observation, Vic. Yeah, and I resonate with a lot of that. Uh, you know, for me, it's been one of those things I, I, I feel like, um, you know, the, my family meals, I think I'm, I'm valuing those a little bit more because there's so many of them, uh, weirdly enough. Uh, and, um, you know, the, and plus I'm, I'm cooking a lot more, I think, than I, than I normally have. Um, and then, you know, we had our, we had our end of year retreat with our volunteers this last week. And, uh, what a blessing that was to share a few last meals, you know, with them as, as volunteers. Um, and then, you know, uh, some of the connections, you know, that we've had with, that I have, I've had with people over <laughs> Zoom or other, you know, video things. I know there's a group of people I get together with every Friday night, um, and we have a happy hour. Um, we share a drink with each other over, uh, over the internet. Um, it's kind of complicated when you try to do a cheers, um, <laughs> you're running to the camera. Uh, but it, you know, that, that those have been really valuable to me in terms of, um, connecting with, with, with God and with, with God and others. Uh, I've really appreciated that. And I, and I, and I really appreciate human connection so much more than I did <laughs> before all of this. Um, and, and how wonderful it is just to get together with people, um, um, you know, whether that be, you know, from a distance or whether that's from, uh, you know, over, over the magic of, of the internet. Um, so uh, any final thoughts? I, I don't see any comments or questions, uh, any additional comments or questions from Facebook, and we're getting kind of close to the end of our time together. Uh, so I'd like to hear if you had any uh, final thoughts, Father Keith and Vicki. Uh, Vicki? I think um, another new phenomena, another new communion that we're seeing, especially in light of all of the turmoil in our world over the last few weeks is the compassionate presence that people have to each other, recognizing that people need to lay down their um, shield of fear and be vulnerable and say, I don't know, I don't, you know, I don't understand and listen to people's stories. Um, last night on the news, I, I heard they had, talked about a woman who invited, there was a repair person that came into her house and she asked him, tell me why this is important to you. And they had a three hour conversation about what it meant to be a man of African-American descent. Mm. She said she had never spoken to somebody who didn't look like her before that. They have since become fast friends and they now sit and have a meal every week. Um, to coin a phrase from Dave Kelly, um, we can't judge people by the chapter we come into in, the, in their lives, but we have to um, be willing to read the chapter with them and be willing to be vulnerable and say, I don't understand, please explain this to me. I wanna learn from you, I, tell me why this is important. And like you said, Tim, at the very beginning, be willing to listen. 
I would, uh, to sum up, I would uh, like to offer this. Uh, one way to deconstruct the word communion is common union. And when we think of our common union with Christ, we think about the Eucharist we share, not only with the people we're praying with at a particular time, but with people around the world, with people throughout history. Uh, we are part of a communion of saints. We share what they share. Um, and that we share a common union with each other on many, many levels. And the way we, we further peace and justice is by focusing on our commonality, is by focusing on how we are united with each other. And that requires us to lay aside our prejudices and our fear and our hate and our anxiety and become what we eat and drink, become the body of Christ. Well, thanks, Father Keith, and thanks, Vicki. Uh, I'm looking forward to next week when I can just be uh, a talking head um, and, and not have to navigate everything else. Uh, but it's been, a, it's been a pleasure having you, and uh, we're talking with the two of you. I always, I always love uh, sitting at your feet and listening um, and occasionally talking. Uh, so... Um, thank you both very much uh, <clears throat> for being here today. So uh, Tapping the Wine Cellar is a presentation of the Missionaries of the Precious Blood Kansas City Province. Uh, we invite you to check out our website uh, where you can find a bunch of different stuff. Our website is preciousbloodkc.org. This week we have a statement from our provincial, Father Gary Richmeyer, on the murder of George Floyd. There's articles from Father Joe Eaker and Father Mark Miller and a video reflection from Father Joe Nazel. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Take care of each other. And one great way to do that is to wear a mask when you are in public. Uh, we all hope you have a great rest of your week and God's blessings on you.